Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anton Muscatelli. I'm the principal of uh, the University of Glasgow, and it's uh, my very great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the first of the 2014 Gifford Lecture Series. Now, the Gifford Lectures began in 1888, having been established through a substantial bequest from Lord Gifford. Gifford was born in Edinburgh in, in 1820, and he had two main interests in life. One was the law, and the other was natural theology. As a lawyer, he moved up the ranks quickly, successfully, and indeed accumulating considerable wealth on the way. And indeed, he was called to the bar in 1849. He became advocate deputy in 1861, and taking his seats as associated judge in the court of session as Lord Gifford in 1870. It was noted that he was popular as a lawyer, famed for his clear-headed thinking, fairness, and advocacy of common sense over legal technicalities. So he was a very wise man. But he was more than this. He was in great demand for public lectures. He, his subjects, however, did not just cover jurisprudence, as you might have imagined, but indeed ranged across his other great loves, including natural theology. So lectures on Emerson, substance, Hindu incar incarnationism, Spinoza were just a few of the thinkers and areas that fascinated him and formed the content of his lectures. It was this latter interest that led him, no doubt, to establish the Gifford Lectures. They were intended to be a major public lecture series run at the four ancient universities in Scotland and were aimed at, quote, promoting, advancing, teaching and diffusing the study of natural theology. With only a three-year break during the Second World War, the lectures have been delivered annually since their inception. It was Gifford's wish that the lectures would be public and open to the community, as in his own words he was, and I quote, persuaded that nothing but good can result from free discussion. He suggested other conditions. He was keen that the Gifford lecturer should change, again I quote, it being desirable that the subject be promoted and illustrated by different minds. And there's no doubt that the prestige and freshness of the Gifford lectures rests on the quality and caliber of its lecturers, who down through the years have represented a wide range of important thinkers from the world of religion, of science, and theology. And I'm delighted to say that Professor Jean-Luc Marion, our Gifford lecturer for 2014, more than maintains this tradition. It's both reassuring and a bit daunting, not uh, least the lecturer, I'm sure, to read Gifford's conditions associated with the appointment. Let me quote again. The lecturer's appointed shall be the subject to no test of any kind and shall not be required to take any oath. They may be of any denomination whatever or no denomination at all. They may be of any religion, of no religion, skeptics or agnostics or free thinkers, providing they be able, reverend men, true thinkers, sincere lovers of and earnest inquirers after truth. Well, I'm not sure which boxes Professor Marion would want to tick, but uh, let me say that from all I hear, we have in him a true thinker, an earnest inquirer after truth. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to him now. In one sense, of course, Professor Marion is no stranger to our campus. We were absolutely delighted to award him an honorary Doctor of Letters degree in June last year, and so count him amongst our honorary alumni. So it's really a case of welcome Jean-Luc back tonight, which I'm delighted to do. Professor Marion is currently the Andrew Thomas Greeley and Grace McNichols Greeley Professor of Catholic Studies and Professor of the Philosophy of Religions and Theology at the University of Chicago. Previous to that, he was Docteur et il cycle um, Université Paris-Sorbonne and Docteur d'État, also Université Paris-Sorbonne. Professor Marion studies both the history of modern philosophy and contemporary phenomenology. Over the years, he has a, had a particular interest in Descartes, publishing several books on his ontology, rational theology, and metaphysics. He also continues to pursue and publish the results of his long-term inquiry into the question of God in books such as The Idol in Distance, and God without being. In reduction and givenness, he initiated a phenomenology of givenness, which was further developed in books and essays such as Being Given, an essay on the phenomenology of givenness, and in and the book In Excess, studies on saturated phenomena and the erotic phenomenon. Professor Marion has been awarded the Grand Prix de Philosophie de l'Académie Française. In 2008, he won the Karl Jaspers Prize of the City and University of Heidelberg in Germany, 
and the Humboldt Stiftung Prize in 2012. He was elected to l'Académie Française in 2008 and received a uh, Immortel member in 2010. In 2009, he was elected to the Accademia dei Lincei in Rome. Professor Marion will be delivering four Gifford lectures and conducting two student seminars and a, a Hunty and lunchtime talk whilst in Glasgow. So we're working him very hard and we're very grateful to him for, for spending all this time on campus. Professor Marion, we are very welcome to the university. Welcome back to the university. We're delighted that you accepted our invitation to come. Thank you also for undertaking such a full program with our staff, with the public, and with students, and we do appreciate your time and effort. Can I now ask you, without further delay, to deliver the first of your 2014 lectures? Thank you very much for this very friendly and, uh, and uh, uh, warm uh, introduction. I feel uh, uh, very grateful to the University of, of Glasgow and to the Gifford Committee for inviting me to give those lectures. Uh, I understand that it is a bit surprising for me to give those lectures for some obvious reasons, being not uh, an English-speaking uh, intellectual, being uh, uh, worse than that, being a, a speculative, continental, phenomenological philosopher, uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, not concealing my uh, uh, openly uh, uh, denominational Catholicism. So it's a bit uh, surprising for me <laughs> to, to, to take uh, uh, my uh, uh, my stand in the in the in the tradition of uh, the Gifford lectures, which are intended uh, to support uh, uh, natural theology uh, uh, in a very uh, uh, enlightenment tradition, which indeed I've studied as an historian of philosophy. But uh, there is a bit of a paradox there. But after all, uh, the Gifford lectures were, were given to and given by uh, theologians as uh, 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 Karl Barth, uh, Rolf Bultmann, and some few others. So I uh, feel myself allowed to uh, be uh, in their track. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I'm I think I should uh, make two points before starting uh, the program of those uh, lectures. Uh, givenness and revelation. What are the two real issues there? There is one about uh, revelation and another about givenness. Let us start with revelation. Revelation is about the question of God, and more precisely, historically speaking, revelation is a concept in opposition to natural knowledge of God about the existence of God. And when we use revelation, that is, when we contradict with revelation, the very notion of natural knowledge of God, we assume uh, some uh, concealed and hidden questions. The first is this. Uh, is there any purely and merely natural access to God, which could be conceived without being today, in the real world, uh, already contaminated, so to speak, by uh, a kind of biblical knowledge. That is, the first difficulty with natural knowledge of God 
is that whether we can assume that this natural knowledge of God is still possible for us. Or whether it is only a retrospective abstraction, as if we could face the question as if we were not yet uh, educated, instructed, framed, willingly or not, uh, uh, by uh, the biblical, biblical tradition. So I would uh, not assume uh, that, in this, again, the, 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 the founder of the Gifford Lecture, I would not take for granted that we can use as a category the concept of natural knowledge of God. Second point. Uh, does not the so-called natural knowledge of God develop all, all its steps a kind of belief or disbelief, a kind of faith, as well as the uh, supernatural knowledge of God is supposed to do? My point is, when we discuss about God, even from a strictly rationalistic point of view, or even an atheistic point of view, are we not, uh, from the beginning, uh, uh, intrinsically uh, 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 involved in the questions, the issues of belief, disbelief, and faith. As if between the uh, confessional, denominational access to God and the non-denominational uh, and uh, scientific and purely rational access to God, nevertheless, the same operations were not at stake. That is, we have to admit, to disagree, to believe, or not to believe. So why, in the case of God, is it so difficult to have a pure argumentation without moments when the issue is about believing or not, trusting or not, accepting or not? If the question of God could be uh, asked and answered on a purely rational way, this question would have been yet answered. And if it is not yet answered in a definitive way, we may guess that because in this case we cannot distinguish clearly between belief and demonstration, conviction and theorem or something like that. Why? What is the singularity, the exception of the question of God compared to other questions? I think if we admit, we assume from the beginning that there, that there is the natural theology and the supernatural theology, if we assume that division, we shall never be able to face this question. And the last point, so I would say there is in the allegedly different, two different access to God, natural theology and supernatural denominational theology, and there is, it remains nevertheless, an epistemological university. In both cases, and not only in one of them, we have to deal with belief, disbelief, faith, uh, skepticism, and so on, in both cases. Third point. The distinction between natural and supernatural or revealed theology, this distinction, as we shall see right now in the first lecture, is very 
recent, it is modern. And it is directly linked to the interpretation of reason as philosophy and to the interpretation of philosophy as metaphysics, as it was the case as a turning moment of early modern philosophy, 16th, 17th century. The question is whether today, in a situation where no philosopher uh, would agree without reservation that we are doing metaphysics, and if some stand for metaphysics, they are very uh, serious about giving a new definition of metaphysics. So we cannot assume anymore that metaphysics is the standard definition of philosophy. So my question is whether this distinction between natural and theological knowledge of God can remain sustainable in a situation where philosophy does not assume anymore, at least without reservation, the title of metaphysics. So we have an issue about the meaning of revelation. That will be my first concern. And we have an issue, second point, with the question of givenness. Why givenness? Givenness is, means, in my uh, own views, uh, the, the most accurate definition of what a phenomenon is. Philosophy, as you know, in his, in, during the last century, has, among other trends, developed into uh, the tradition of phenomenology. According to phenomenology, the question about the things we have to know as philosophers is not first whether those things do exist or not, but it is about how they appear. The real question before deciding the essence of the, es the existence of things in the world is first to describe which appear and how. So the question of the appearing, the mode of appari apparition of the things as phenomena becomes crucial and the first. I made my best uh, to establish that the question of the self-manifestation of the things is a question of their givenness. Something cannot make itself visible if it does not give it does not give itself. So the question is the question of philosophy is about appearing in givenness. This question can be asked for any possible phenomenon. And here, the so-called revealed theology makes no exception. Let us uh, admit this very simple uh, Remark. Biblical narrative don't deal, first of all, with the existence of God or with the existence of the characters involved in God self manifestation. Those narrative deal with manifestations. Manifestations of God, manifestation of the demons, manifestation of the angels, <laughs> and after all the angels mean to some extent manifestations themselves, manifestations of, by the, of the prophets, of the apostle, about manifestations. This going from 
Theophanias to witnesses. And uh, it is quite difficult, the tradition is, uh, is, an, uh, 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 um, is uh, uh, unanimous about that, it is not that easy to connect philosophical, the philosophical question of existence with the biblical narratives. And there is uh, the big gap which was described as the gap between Hellenic, an Hellenic point of view and a Jewish point of view. But if we consider that the biblical narrative are directly interested in the question of appearing, manifestations, phenomenalizations, at that moment, the gap is not that big between what phenomenology, that is, to one of the most powerful traditions in philosophy today, and the biblical narrative are dealing with. It is about the manifestation and the way of this manifestation. So my second question is this. How far is it possible to re evaluate the concept of revelation starting from a phenomenological point of view. What does that mean? To reveal itself, or self himself, if we consider that revelation is a special case of phenomenality, as described by classical phenomenology which has a doctrine explaining why a phenomenon can manifest itself or cannot, under what conditions, within what limits, and uh, uh, how far. Is it possible to consider all the manifestations, or some of them, in the Old and New Testament as special cases of phenomenality? This is my second concern. So I have two issues to raise in front of you. One, which is a critical one, that, which is, what does that mean, the distinction between natural and revealed theology? I, will, I shall question that distinction. And a positive, a positive issue, is there the possibility to uh, frame and describe another possible understanding of the meaning of revelation as a phenomenological issue. So we shall uh, in deal with the first question during the two first uh, lectures and the seminar concluding them this week, and the question about the phenomenality of revelation will be, in a more positive way, dealt, de dealt with in the uh, lecture three and four, and the last concluding seminar next week. I would, uh, before starting, uh, 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 thank Thank again uh, my translator, uh, Stephen Lewis, who is a very good translator, and once again he has done a great job, and uh, Professor Romana Fotiad for taking care of a final uh, uh, revision of the old uh, stuff. So let us start uh, with the uh, first issue. And the first part of this issue, the aporia of the concept of revelation. This aporia consisting in the epistemological interpretation of revelation. We only need a simple lexicography called study of the term of revelation in the history of Christian theology to, to uncover some surprising discoveries. The first surprise lies in the finding, widely accepted by best 
the best scholars, that the very term revelation was rather late in imposing itself as a major concept in dogmatic theology. Thus, considering its first appar its apparition uh, is mentioned by uh, the, Vatican, the first Vatican Council, Heinrich Fries notes that this expression arises, quote, I quote, zwar in grundsätzlicher Sicht zu relativ spät, später Zeit, in a rather relatively late time. And uh, every Dulles, uh, the late Cardinal Every Dulles, gave a confirmation, I quote, since revelation did not emerge as a major theological theme, theme until after the Enlightenment. In most early theologians, as in the Bible itself, there is no systematic doctrine of revelation, end of quote. And likewise, the Jesuit uh, great scholar Bernard, says, French Jesuit Bernard Sesbouy, uh, said once, quote, Revelation was not the object of special consideration in the Patriarchist period either. The idea went without saying God had spoken to men through the prophets and then in his son Jesus Christ. The term itself, apocalypsis, referred instead to particular literature, the apocalyptic literature. Scholastic theology spoke of revelation relatively little in its doctrinal statements, but more often in scriptural commentaries and in reflections on prophecy, which this is true mostly for the early uh, period of scholasticism. But more than that, one might be yet further surprised, and rightly so, that such a late arriving concept, considered for so long as marginal, if not useless, took on in a very recent area, I mean 17th century and above all German 19th century, an ever growing importance to the point of appearing to be almost a synonym for theology. The French theologian Jean Yves Lacoste soberly notes this time lag, I quote, a central reality of Christian experience, and yet a long marginal concept, revelation undoubtedly is looked at as an organizing notion in contemporary theology, end of quote. But can we, or should we, content ourselves with these, with these contradictory determinations, belatedness, and then the dominant role of uh, revelation in the theological discourse. There is more, for it is not enough simply to combine those two features to overcome their at least apparent incoherence and build up a consistent concept of revelation, because this combination amounts eventually to a final paradox. I quote, uh, a theologian from Belgium, uh, André Léonard, which is a good theologian but a bit conservative, so he cannot be suspected to, have, uh, uh, to be in opposition to uh, tradition. And he says, quote, everything depends on divine revelation. Everything refers to it. Nothing is, is explained except in its light. And this is perhaps the reason why it remains paradoxically as one of these great truths that shine so bright and are so certain that they do not need to be explained. <laughs> Which is quite surprising. It is so central, so uh, uh, sh uh, shedding lights, so uh, crucial that it should not have no need to be explained. And this is not said in a critical, uh, with a, any critical intention, but in a very positive uh, uh, understanding. Indeed, revelation as a concept truly needs to be explained for several reasons. Precisely because it came 
very late in the tra in tradition, 12th century, with a very unprecise status, we shall see that, and at the end, reach what uh, uh, Peter Althaus had uh, described as an inflation, an inflation of the concept of revelation, which was achieved at the very moment where this concept lacked the most any clear definition. As so often in the history of Christian theology, we should not avoid here to go back to Thomas Aquinas in order to set our feet on solid ground. But, and this is true for the concept of revelation as well. But at, as it is also often the case, Thomas Aquinas makes the difficulty that will follow arise in its origin. Let us begin with the opening of the Summa Theologiae, first part, first question, first article, which asks whether the knowledge of God may come from philosophy alone or if it requires another instance, a sacra doctrina. Thomas adds to the conclusion that, alongside philosophical approach to God through pure reason, another doctrine must necessarily be accepted, the sacra doctrina, which proceeds by revelation. By right, and in fact, the theologia included in metaphysica does not exhaust the whole notion of theology. For the, I quote, theologia quae er sacram doctrinam pertinet differt secundum genus abilla doctrina quae pars philosophiae ponitur. Theology included in sec sacred doctrine differs in a kind from that, that theology which is a part of philosophy, end of quote. This is what Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas has already clearly established in a previous commentary, his commentary on Boethius de Trinitate, by saying theology or divine science is split in two. Theologia, civis scientia divina, est duplex. And only theology understood as sacra doctrina can claim to know divine things in themselves, since it alone receives them as they manifest themselves. In Latin, secundum quod ipsae se ipsas manifestant, according as they manifest themselves. More precisely, the sacred doctrine, sacra doctrina, takes those things straight as their direct subject of knowing, because it receives them from those things themselves in the scripture. As for philosophical or metaphysical theology, because in this text, Thomas Aquinas makes the identification between philosophy and metaphysica, philosophy prosequantur, <coughs> uh, 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 Philosophiam, quae alio nomine metaphysica dicitu. Philosophical or metaphysical theology can only reach divine, divine things indirectly through their effects, per effectos manifestantur. Insofar as they come under the only real subject of metaphysica, which is being as being. The science of being as such can deal with divine things, but only to the very narrow extent that those things enter in as the principle of their effects. And since, since only their effects, and not the things themselves, are articulated according to bigness, it is necessary to conclude that the divine things do not lie directly within the field of metaphysical theology, but only indirectly, as the principle 
the substratum of those things, but not as the things studied by metaphysics. Non tanquam subjectum scientiae, sed tanquam principium subjecti. So, in philosophy, human reason has no direct access to the divine things, but only to the effects, the created effects of the divine things. It's only for the so-called revealed theology that there is a direct access to the divine things. In other words, the divine things are recognized as subject only of theologia sacrae scripturae, the theology of sacred scriptures. <clears throat> For the rest, it is only insofar as the divine things can be translated into their ontological effects that they can be studied by the, theological, uh, the philosophical theology. From this first distinction, there follow a first conclusion. The duality of theology is defined through the limitation of metaphysical theology to the ans in quantum ans, which by contrast opens the possibility for a theology of sacra scriptura or sacra doctrina. And yet, this conclusion raises a difficulty. Since the unquestionable possibility remains of in an indeterminate status, the fact that revelation according to scripture is opposed to, completes, and surpasses the philosophical science of God cannot, as such, supply itself with the dignity of a science. If theological knowledge of God surpasses the philosophical, that is, scientific knowledge of God, this does not mean that theology as revealed theology keeps the status of a science. Or at least you may ask the question, how far what surpasses the philosophical science of God remains itself a science. This question, the questionable status of theological knowledge of God as a science, this question should be asked. And yet, as it seems, the possibility of such a scientific interpretation of Sacra Doctrina is assumed by Thomas Aquinas, who developed an epistemological interpretation of Revelation. However, essentially indeterminate it may remain. The body of the, the answer in Summa Theologiae 1, Part 1, Question 1, Article 1, establishes and privilege the epistemological function of Sacra Doctrina, or Theologia Sacrae Scripturae, by two arguments. The first displays an implicit syllogism. First <coughs> sentence, premise, God constitutes man final end, without any alternative or consideration of any duplex beatitudo. Second, man can neither desire nor love anything that it does not first know, according to the principle that one may love only what one knows. And God, as we have just seen, remains unknown to the merely natural light of Theologia Philosophica. Therefore, three, it is necessary that beyond the natural light of reason, another source of knowledge allows the natural desire for God to know what is necessarily love, what it necessarily loves. This will be, no this will be knowledge by a revelation coming from God 
and thus exceeding human reason. Revelationem, per revelationem divinam, quae rationem humanam excedit. This first premise rests on a strong point, the essential paradox, made evident by Henri de Lubac, that man, as a rational creature, is able of God, capax Dei, and enjoys the privilege of naturally desiring a nevertheless supernatural goal, which he cannot attain without a supernatural support of a divine revelation. So the epistemological insufficiency, the inability to know by the means of his nature, its uh, naturally supernatural goal, nevertheless constitute for man, from the point of view of beatitude and final destiny, an infinite privilege. In other words, <coughs> it is better, I quote, it is better for a rational creature against any other creature to be able to receive a supreme good by vision of the divine essence, even if to get it is nature is insufficient. And in the contrary, his nature needs the uh, uh, support of divine grace. So for Thomas Aquinas, to some extent, the supernatural knowledge follows from the constitution of human nature. The privilege of human nature is that it can uh, be uh, completed only with the full knowledge of God. This is the privilege of man. But the nature of man, being finite, cannot achieve that privilege. So it is naturally uh, necessary for man to enjoy a supernatural knowledge of God. That's the first argument. So it's why the super, the revealed knowledge of God is not uh, 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 optional for the nature of man. This is the first argument. And it is very important that this first argument, which uh, in according to the anthropology of the church father, is very compelling. Nevertheless, implies that the supernatural uh, gift of the knowledge of God means that grace is all about knowing. This implies an epistemological interpretation of the supernatural grace of God. And this is made even clearer with the second argument. The second argument raised by uh, Thomas Aquinas is this, in the same text. Not only the supernatural knowledge of God is required by the nature of man, but even the short and narrow knowledge of God, which we can reach by the natural understanding of God. Even this philosophical theology has to be supported and reinforced by the revelation and by the supernatural knowledge of God. How far? <clears throat> Thomas Aquinas argues this way. Supposing that human reason, pure and simple, could know God, revelation would nevertheless be necessary. Otherwise, if the knowledge of God were restrained only to what human reason, limited to his own light, could get of it, there would follow 
a triple limitation. Only some few people, Pauki, the expert, the philosopher, would know God. They would do so, second, only after a very long search, per longum tempus, and finally, not without the admixture of many errors. But otherwise, if philosophical theology had the exclusivity of the natural knowledge of God, the great majority of mankind would have a very narrow and very poor access to it. Revelation, therefore, must enter in, immediate, in immediately after the natural light for an imperative, so I would say pastoral reason, to give to everyone the right to salvation. Therefore, the superiority of revelation over human reason thus proves itself to be double, but in both cases, always epistemological. First of all, because it's alone, the theological knowledge of God allows us to know God directly, and not only indirectly in its effects, but next, because the revealed theology allows everyone to know God and know him with certainty by substituting itself for or completing the deficient contributions of natural light of human reason. The answers to these arguments confirm that revelation must first and above all extend itself as a communication of sciences without either the equality of knowledge thus dispersed by the two sources, or especially the other function of this relation being taken directly into consideration, foremost among these, the grace of sanctification of its witness. In this way, the answer to the first argument emphasizes that the revealed truth must not be examined by reason, thus already setting up an opposition between truths known by revelation and those known by pure reason. An opposition which, in fact, connects and compares two different ways of the same and only knowledge. We could consequently conclude that for Thomas, the two meaning of the knowledge of God are ruled under the same interpretation of knowledge of God as a science. And there are some few additional arguments to support this interpretation. I shall try only to sum them up quickly uh, because we have another uh, other, uh, argument to see. The first argument is the doctrine of the subordination of sciences. What is the relation between the philosophical and the revealed theology, according to Thomas Aquinas? As it was uh, clearly explained by the French Dominican Chenu, Thomas Aquinas made a special and crucial turn in the definition of, sci of theology when he tries to articulate the revealed theology with the natural philosophical theology according to a conceptual model borrowed from Aristotle, that of the subordination of sciences. According to Aristotle in the Second Analytics, the most formal sciences, mathematics, can rule less formal sciences. For example, arithmetic gives the formal rules for music, and as uh, geometry gives the formal rules for astronomy. Astronomy is geometry with motion, and music is uh, arithmetic with time. So the formal understanding of the 
subordinated sciences, I mean <laughs> uh, 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 music and astronomy, have to be borrowed from the upper sciences, more abstract, which are arithmetic and geometry. According to Thomas Aquinas, we can do the same thing between the revealed theology of the Sacra Doctrina, which deal directly by revelation and scripture with the really divine realities, which are the upper science, to which the lower philosophical theology is subordinated. So there is an artic a formal articulation between those two uh, 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 theologies, as for Aristotle, between mathematics and applied mathematics, as he used to define the astronomy or the music. This argument can be uh, uh, criticized very strongly for two reasons. One borrowed from Thomas Aquinas itself and another from Aristotle. From the point of view of Aristotle, the subordination of sciences implies that we know from the beginning that we have to deal with two sciences. But in the case of the two theology, we know for sure that the philosophical theology can be seen as a science using the categories of being which in that time were seen as scientific. But we have no arguments, at least no obvious arguments, to assume that the Sacra Doctrina give us any information about a scientific understanding of the biblical narrative. And this is so, so we cannot connect two levels of sciences because, in fact, among those two terms, only one can be taken for sure for science, the philosophical theology, not the other. This counter-argument to Thomas Aquinas can be supported by another counter argument borrowed directly from Thomas Aquinas, which can be seen in uh, this time uh, the uh, Summa Contra Gantes, the first chapter of Book 4, the last one. This first chapter is dealing again with the question of the articulation of the different ways to know God. But by opposition to the Summa Theologiae, where there is two levels, here in this Summa Philosophica, Summa Contra Gantes against non-Christian believers or skeptics, in that case, there is three levels. Let us uh, uh, check those three levels. The first level, is the science by pure natural light of reason. That is a philosophical understanding of God by the effect. So the Theologia Philosophica. This Theologia Philosophica is indirect, only dealing with the effect of a possible God, not with the essence of that possible God. We know that. Two. There is revealed theology, but revealed theology is now divided in two. First, there is revealed theology in this time, in this life, in via, in, on the road, when we are on the go. In that case, it is only by faith, fides by hearing, fides ex auditu. In that case, we know because we take for sure what we believe, but we don't see. So we can say there is subordination between the philosophical theology, first level, 
and the knowledge of God by faith. But it is not a, an epistemological subordination because faith is not a science. So when we believe, we, to some extent, know more about God than philosophers do, but it is not by the same kind of knowledge than the philosopher. The philosopher know less, but with a scientific status. The believer knows more, but without the certainty of knowledge, only certainty of faith. So we have a subordination, but it is not an epistemological one in the sense of Christ's law. This subordination would be possible, indeed, if we could have the third level of knowledge of God, that is, the visio beatifica, that is, the science of God, by God and by the saints, scientia beatorum. The scientia beatorum is absolutely certain, as our faith in this life, but has a clear vision as required by a science. So there is a possible subordination, but only of the philosophical theology to the theological revealed theology, but only in the case of God and the saints. So for Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Confragantes, it is very clear that the argument of subordination, of the subordination of the two meanings of theology in the Summa Theologia can work only in the eschatological situation of the final vision of God, not in this life. So you can even argue in a consistent way and uh, following the logic of Thomas Aquinas that there is no actual subordination of the philosophical uh, theology to the revealed theology. Which means that the distinction is unsteady. So let us see how unsteady it is. I dropped some other uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> argument. And I would like to go directly through what appears to me as the unavoidable consequence of this epistemological interpretation of revelation, unduly done by Thomas Aquinas, which is the final position of lay scholasticism by Suarez. Uh, no need to... Uh, uh, to uh, emphasize how important these Jesuits at the very end of the 16th century in Spain and Rome was. Suarez is really the uh, real uh, uh, master of early modern philosophy. He has framed all the concepts used by uh, the classical philosophy up to, at least, to Hegel, uh, dialogic. Anyway, in the case of uh, uh, revelation, in the definition of uh, 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 revealed theology, he played a very central role. By asserting that revelation and I, I quote here uh, the, the first book of his treatise on Trinity, uh, chapter 12, section 2. Under the name of revelation, what is indicated is only the proposition, the sufficient, pro the sufficient proposition of the revealed object. No matter whether 
it is believed by the one who gets this revelation or whether this revelation is given in an interior mode by God itself, by the angels, or by the oral communication of other men. Again, for Suarez, what a revelation is? A revelation is purely the content of the proposition. He calls the proposition the utterance, the sentence, we would say, the sufficient proposition. That is, something is said, and we can understand the meaning of what is said. And this meaning remains the same whether we believe it or not, whether we get it by a special uh, uh, experience spiritual experience given directly by God himself, or indirectly by an angel, or just by reading or listening to a lecture. The way we behave towards the content of the proposition plays no roles about the meaning of the proposition. So you can be an atheist or believer. The proposition, uh, I am... Uh, the way, the truth, and uh, the life has the same meaning. And it's why revealed theology is a science. It is a science because you can study and develop a scientific understanding of revealed theology without uh, believing it or questioning it, the difference between an atheistic point of view and a believing point of view has no importance. And it's why there is a theological revealed science. And he uses the formulation in Latin et si fides non daretur, even if faith would not be uh, in play. This formulation, et si fides non daretur, is uh, 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 a quotation of the very famous uh, 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 assumption about logical truth, which since uh, Dan Scotus, through uh, Occam up to uh, Suarez, are true. Uh, two plus two are four. There is three uh, angles in a triangle, and so on. All those formal truths are eternal, unconditioned, and would have been true et si Deus non daretu, even if God were was not given. This is a standard assumption that truth remained independent of God. This was true uh, in logic by theologians, in formal logic, in mathematics. It was taken over by Grotius in the doctrine of law, and indeed, uh, uh, Descartes has opposed that. It was assumed by Kepler, by uh, uh, Galileo, as well in physics. The law of science would have remained the same without God. This not said by atheistic, uh, atheists, but by good believers, more convinced of the truth of sciences than of the truth of God. And <coughs> this is exactly the position of uh, Suarez. Revelation makes a science possible because the truth of revelation is not submitted to the faith of the 
believer. And it's why uh, Suarez uh, comes to the conclusion, and I quote the text which comes from the Fractatus Defide on the, on the face, Book 1, Distinction 3, Section 2, Article 6, Revelatio autem est quasi informatio. Revelation, so to speak, is as an information. By information, he means indeed the information that is to give a form to matter. But he means too what we mean today by information. Revelation is another way to get information. Another way than natural reason. What differences remain between natural reason and revealed uh, theology if both are informations? Indeed, it is not up to us to get the information given to us by revelation, by the biblical text, the biblical narrative, and the uh, theological, uh, the revealed theology, the Sacra Doctrina, as it is up to us to get other information by the pure use of natural light of the understanding. But if there are two different origins, one up to us, the other not up to us. Nevertheless, what both share in common is the fact that they give, they give, they give information. Revelation is another way to get information. Exactly as on the screen of our computer, we can get information from different sources. We can get information for, uh, from our own files, or depending how widely we are connected to other uh, sources, we can get other information from the outside. But in both cases, on the screen, the, the information are of the same kind. And this is the epistemological interpretation of revelation. May I insist on the fact that all the debate between faith and reason about God comes back to the opposition between the possible, a possible knowledge, positive or negative, by reason about God versus the possible knowledge by scripture different kind of scripture, because there is a competition between sacred scriptures, and different in interpretation of those, uh, of those different scriptures. This is supposed to be revealed theology. And when we discuss uh, this in, uh, uh, between theologians, believers or not believers, and so on, it's always we have the assumption that there are two competing knowledges. The question is how far revelation is another source of knowledge about God. What does that mean, knowledge in that case? This is the unasked question. Is there an equivocity of the meaning of knowledge, of science of God? What does that mean when we say there is two way of knowing God, one which is natural and the other which is not, revealed. Indeed, we can say that, but can we think what we mean? That is, what is exactly the meaning of knowledge in both cases? <clears throat> a final point has a, a more positive conclusion. <clears throat> As I uh, explained at the beginning, 
the concept of revelation uh, can surprise us because he came into the theological debate very late. To some extent, we could say that Thomas Aquinas was the first to use it in a systematic way. We have no real, with some exception we shall see next time, uh, St. Augustine, but a very strange way, surprising way. We have no theory of revelation in the modern meaning uh, before Thomas Aquinas. Nevertheless, this concept has imposed itself in contemporary theology. Think of Barth, for instance, or Bultmann, or uh, Moltmann, and many others. How far this concept, reason versus revelation, the two theology, was used by, say, uh, uh, one of the most uh, consistent uh, uh, record of the evolution of uh, Christian theology in uh, the teaching of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. It is very surprising that the word revelation was never used in uh, the councils before the first council of the Vatican in 1870. Uh, the question of revelation was not as such uh, 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 asked by the Council of Trento. The Council of Trento, when discussing uh, the sources of faith, uh, that is uh, uh, scripture, tradition, uh, written tradition, unwritten uh, tradition, scripture, and unwritten teaching, is referring all this to the, what, we, we, what it's called, the purity of uh, the gospel, not to revelation. What is done by Trento is to make, nevertheless, a distinction, quoting, in fact, two very famous verses uh, of the New Testament. For what we call the natural knowledge, it refers to Roman 1, 19, 20. What was invisible in, in God was made visible by being known uh, from the uh, thing made by God. And for the biblical knowledge of God, the verse which supported this other way of knowing God is Hebrew 1 1, that is, God after, uh, has manifested itself in many times and in many ways, first by the prophets, then by his own son. This, uh, those two verses, which are absolutely central, are taken over by the council of, the first council of the Vatican. And for the first time, this council identifies the two ways of knowing God by uh, considering one as the, uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, natural knowledge of God, what can be known by, I quote, the natural power of human reason, naturally humanae rationis lumine, quoting Roman 120, and quoting Hebrew 1 1, refers to a supernatural way, supernaturalia via. So it's only in as late as 1870 that for the first time in the uh, official teaching of the Catholic Church, there was the use of the two uh, ways of knowing God. The first time that the, posi the, official, the position of Thomas Aquinas was assumed 
To my knowledge, it was never assumed earlier. But what is very surprising is that also uh, Vatican the first, the first Vatican of Council, took over those two understanding, possible understanding of theologia, theologia naturalis, theologia supernaturalis. He made no attempt to connect them by the principle of subordination, by telling that the natural knowledge, the philosophical knowledge of God could be subordinated to the revealed theology as a science to an upper science. And from a Thomistic point of view, would the Council have assumed the opening decision of Thomas Aquinas? They should have uh, gone to the end, to the conclusion, that is, assume this subordination. They did not. But more surprising is the, the final position of the Second Council of the Vatican, Vatican II, in uh, Dei Verbum, which, to the, uh, according to the, the agreement of all uh, historians of theology, is the achievement of the theology of revelation, because the constitution Dei Verbum is De Revelatione, clearly on revelation. And it is a final uh, statement about the sources of revelation, scripture, tradition, and so forth. But in this case, there is no more the distinction between the Theologia Naturalis and the Via Supernaturalis. Why? Because according to uh, Vatican II, uh, revelation is first of all <coughs> God self-revelation. I read uh, Dei Verbum, uh, section chapter one. God decided to reveal himself and make known the sacrament of its will. Placuit Deum, de, Deo, semet ipsum revelare et notum facere sacramentus voluntatis sue. And uh, some uh, later, uh, the same chapter one, God displayed himself, se ipsum manifestavit. Here we are, and this language is close to the language of Bart, indeed. Revelation is not a way for us to get more information than we could get from the mere use of our natural, the natural light of human reason. It is not a way to, uh, to connect our computer to another uh, source of information, to plug in another uh, 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 system. It is not a way for us to have more information about God. It is a way for God to manifest itself. Revelation is a self-manifestation of God. Se ipsum manifestavit. To some extent, this is the quotation of Bart. It is the self selbstdarstellung Gottes. God manifesting itself on the scene, live on the scene, on the stage. So it is an event of the self-manifestation of God. Indeed, from a self-manifestation, we can get further information, but we get much more than information. If there is a manifestation, the system of information is able to gather more information, more data. But the manifestation 
is not itself a datum. It is not a mere information. Something real happened. So, uh, this could be commented a lot uh, in, in more details. But if we compare the evolution of the theology of revelation from Thomas Aquinas to early modern times, 17th century, to the actual uh, teaching of, in this case, the Roman Catholic Church. We cannot refrain from uh, discovering quite the discrepancy. Because the epistemological interpre interpretation was as widely received by theologians to the point that in uh, the second part of 19th, of 19th century, some have uh, denounced an inflation of uh, the concept of revelation closely connected to its indetermination. Far from doing that, the teaching of the church was very reluctant to give a definition of this supernatural source of information. Revelatio is, is, informa is information to speak like theorists. As if uh, the ordinary teaching of the church has waited for a new approach to the question of revelation. This new approach, uh, historian of modern theology knows very well that it came from Barth on the, si uh, on the side of reformation and from Balthazar on the Catholic uh, side. Now, what we have to uh, try to understand will be this, and this is my, my conclusion for today. If we have to, if not completely, give up the scholastic interpretation of revelation as a rival science compared to the natural philosophical understanding of God. What should we do if we want to understand what is understood in the real meaning of revelation? Because it is not enough to say that revelation is not a way of knowing. It is a way of knowing. But this way of knowing is surely not equivocal with the epistemological scientific interpretation of knowledge. Again, I go back to one of my first questions. What is so special in the question of God that makes unavoidable when we discuss about knowing, knowing with certainty, with demonstration, with arguments in a rational way, Nevertheless, in that case, some other operations are involved. It is a way of knowing, but not according to the usual understanding of understanding. There are other operations involved. So our question would be, how far in the theological tradition we can find a non-propositional interpretation of the reveal knowledge of God. By non-propositional interpretation, I mean not the propositio sufficiens of Suarez. What is the relation between what is said by the revealed proposition and the way we can get it that it both grasps the meaning and agree with that meaning? Or said otherwise, why to grasp the meaning of revealed knowledge 
it is needed to agree to it. What does that mean? In any other science, we first know, and it is insofar as we know worry that we agree or disagree. In the case of the revealed knowledge, we have a, apparently another uh, uh, epistemological operation to, to deal with, which is we have to agree during the process of grasping the point. What does that mean? Is this rational or not? Can this be explained? This will be our next step. I thank you for your patience. Now we do have a little bit of time for some questions. And what, I, what Professor Marion has also suggested is that if any of you have questions which we can't deal with today, you might want to write it down and perhaps hand them at the front desk because they could be dealt with also in some of the follow-up uh, seminars. But let me open it up, perhaps, yes. And then we'll have um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the, there is a question I'd like to pose to you in terms of the epistemological sense of revelation. who believe, especially in the tradition of Denis the Aeropagite, that direct knowledge of God through experience is incomprehensible. Yep. How do you see this influencing the epistemological um, revelation that you want to propose as a concept? Thank you very much. Uh, well, Two kind of short answer to an uh, uh, unanswerable uh, question. Uh, first, <laughs> I've done my best to explain that uh, in the second part of the idol and distance about Dionysius, and in the final chapter of in excess about uh, the whole question issue of negative theology and of the fact that. The incomprehensibility of God is not, does not mean that we cannot know God. It is the way to know God. In the case of God, to understand why and how far God remains incomprehensible is the right way to have access to God. It's why God is not the same kind of object than the other objects. Second point, it is very clear that uh, what was called in uh, modern theology, uh, in the history of the question of revelation, the propositional interpretation of revelation. I, you, could, you, could, you know, I, I guess, uh, the two books of Cardinal, uh, the late Cardinal Avery Dulles on re the story of the concept of revelation and he explained very clearly this uh, propositional interpretation, which was uh, widely shared by all the Christian denominations, uh, the Calvinist, uh, 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 as the, the, the Catholic uh, went very strongly in that direction to establish the objectivity of faith, as they used to say, <coughs> that is to consider that there is an objective content of the biblical narrative which could be translated into a set of concepts and formulations. This is, to my opinion, the exact opposite of the, uh, 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 what you call mystical, I would not assume that completely, 
the theological approach of God uh, in uh, the uh, patristic tradition, which is both Latin and Greek, uh, the, by the incomprehensibility of God. The incomprehensibility of God is, means that in the case of God, inadequation of the knowledge is not a weakness, an epistemological weakness, which could be corrected, as it is the case in any positive science. If we don't know, if we don't reach the object and the result, it's because our procedure method failed. And because there is perhaps nothing to know, we are going in the wrong direction, we have to modify our procedures and method. Perhaps in the case of God, it is the exact reverse. We failed not because we are using the wrong method, but because any method should, no, not only would, but should fail. Because if we could reach God as any other object, according to the very famous sentence issued by Augustine, if you comprehend it, it is not it. So it may be it as long as you don't comprehend it. Don't say it is a paradox. It is an exception. It is really an exception. But would not God be an exception, it would not be God. So there is no choice. Perhaps there is no God, because there is no exception. But if there is any God, it would be an exception by definition. So in that case, the incomprehensibility appears as the f a, a kind of formal implication of this special case. And the propositional interpretation, the epistemological interpretation of revealed theology missed, to my opinion, completely that point. To the point to <laughs> conclude that the content of a sufficient proposition would remain the same without faith. The question here, you want to Thank you very much for an excellent uh, lecture. Um, my question is, it seems to me that the problem of natural theology that it seemed like you sort of tried to problematize arises from the fact that you have in the Greek philosophers uh, already a kind of uh, theology, right? I mean, they, uh, Aristotle refers to metaphysics as a divine science, and I'm wondering uh, it seems like Thomas Aquinas, uh, with his distinction when he talks about the desiderium naturale that you referred to in your lecture, right? He distinguishes between the possibility of knowledge of God on est, right? That God is, but not the possibility of knowledge of God quid est, what God is, right? And it seems that as though by doing so, he sort of gives a charter in some sense to natural theology because there is the possibility of natural knowledge of the divine existence, if not the divine essence. So I'm just curious, are you challenging the very legitimacy of that distinction between natural theology and revealed theology? In other words, did Thomas sort of take a wrong turn in, in sort of the opening to Aristotle? I guess that's, the, that's sort of the question. Because I think what's interesting about the Greeks and Aristotle and, you know, and, and the Aristotelian is that there is a kind of theology through demonstrative reasons, so. You know, Thomas Aquinas is, is a very special case. For me, uh, I was asked very often whether I was opposing Thomas Aquinas or not. And during a very long time, I was unable to, to give a, a, a clear answer because 
and now I know. Thomas Aquinas is so right that he is always close to be wrong. How to say that? Anyone else who tries to keep the equilibrium reached by Thomas Aquinas failed in the history of uh, the Thomistic reception. No one was able to uh, to play with uh, you say, how do you say that when you send in the air uh, balls juggle. Uh, to, 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 to juggle with so many balls at the same time. Only Thomas Aquinas can do that. All the commentators follow us that they, 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 they let it go down very soon. For instance, it is absolutely uh, uh, earlier than Thomas Aquinas for Christian theologians about the theology, so-called theology of uh, philosophers, there are only two possible positions. Either they will say, yes, they are foreseeing the truth of Christian faith, but were unable to reach uh, the complete understanding of it. So they were only preparatory work. Or they were pagans, they missed everything. And both positions uh, uh, could lead to a very uh, weak and perhaps uh, worse results. Thomas Aquinas decided to make a choice. So there is truth in the, in the theology of the philosopher, compatible with the truth of Christian theology, but not identical to it. This is perfect, but this can lead with any other mind than that of Thomas Aquinas to a double disaster, either the doctrine of two truths, and that led to the two truths, or to the identification of the supernatural truth to the natural truth. And this was the position of metaphysics. So if you are, if you are Thomas Aquinas, you can avoid that. But I am not, and the other were not as well, and they could not avoid that. And I have some admiration that the Catholic Church, which is supposed to be very domestic, in fact, was uh, not very domestic and very cautious about uh, using Thomas Aquinas. And because one of the results of the position of Thomas Aquinas, for instance, was to say, what is common to the theology of philosophy and the revealed theology? There's only one, uh, not only one thing, but the most important thing is that in both cases, God can be thought according to being. The difficulty is that according to Thomas Aquinas, so, and this could lead to the idolatry of metaphysics, where God and being are the same. What is, is the stroke of the genius of Thomas Aquinas? All the, the usual Thomistic interpretation is to insist on the fact that we know God because we know being. So God has, insofar as being, uh, Exodus 3.14 and so on, <coughs> is, 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 is to be. But with this reservation and this is the, all the genius and the tricky genius of Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas said, yes, God is being, but the meaning of being in the case of God is completely unknown to us, <laughs> which is a way to nullify what he has agreed upon first. This is negative theology. So Thomas Aquinas is always that, that kind of, uh, of argument. So, uh, it's why, to my opinion, when uh, a surgeon say, says to me, but I am to me a Thomist, I'm completely certain that he does not understand really what he means. <laughs> one, I think we have time for one more question. 
if I may say so, indeed. God reveals himself through the sacrament of his will. But that was the first time you used the word sacrament in your entire lecture. I'm wondering how much the role of, or the development of sacramentalism within Roman Catholicism in particular, was developed precisely to deal with the discrepancies of the different theologies that you're talking about. Yes. Uh, I was quoting, I was quoting there, uh, Dei Verbum, chapter one. <laughs> so they use uh, uh, God has manifested itself according to the sacramentum uh, eius voluntatis. But in fact, as you know, uh, sacramentum here is uh, the translation of mysterion, it is a quotation of Paul. According to the mysterion, uh, telematos uh, uh, and we shall uh, I shall spend a lot of time in the uh, uh, third lecture about the concept of mysterion sacramentum uh, in the uh, Latin vocabulary uh, of the Roman church is coming from the Vulgata uh, is uh, simply the translation of mysterion so it is not directly a question for sacramental theology, as you refer to, it's more. It is a mysterion. One of my arguments in, in, the, in this lecture will be this: uh, uh, if there is, if, if revelation is a special case of phenomenality, which is my, and it is the only way we can understand that. Apocalypse is a special case of phenomenality. This phenom phenomenality implies always something concealed. There is no discovery if there is no concealment first. And the name of concealment in uh, the New Testament is the mysterion. There is an apocalypse because there is a mysterion, and Paul is exactly the theologian of that. So we shall study, uh, I, shall study I shall allude to those texts of the mysterion at that moment. But it is very uh, impressive that Vatican, the, the Second Council of Vatican, uh, relating the self manifestation of God, the Selbstdarstellung, uh, to the mysterion, uh, in, according to Paul, is clearly uh, interpreting the, the old theology of, of uh, revelation in terms of phenomenality. Yes, that's clear, and not of logical content of a proposition. Well, unfortunately, we do have to draw this uh, to a close. Um, can I just start with a few thank yous? Obviously, thank you to you as an audience for coming and, and uh, not only listening to Professor Marion's first lecture, but also being prepared to, to, to ask some questions and take part in the Q&A. As I said at the beginning, if some of you do have some questions, you'll be they would be very happy to, to receive them and then perhaps they can be picked up in, in, in the subsequent seminars as well. Um, but can I also thank those who have organized the lectures, not only the Gifford Committee, but also those who have been uh, involved in the practical uh, organization. But above all, can I, can I thank Professor Marion for the first of, of his lectures. He set the platform for his remaining colloquia uh, during his time in Glasgow. So thank you again for a fascinating lecture, Jean-Luc, and we look forward to the remaining ones. Thank you very much.